In today's video, I'm going to share my final thoughts on Jose Maria Escriva and Opus Dei. All right, so what do I mean by sharing my final thoughts? Like, I mean, I'm done with this channel. Uh, after, after today's video, I'm not planning on making any other videos or, or thinking about Jose Maria Escriva or Opus Dei anymore. Uh, I hope these videos serve uh, at least one person and make a real difference. That really has been the goal of this channel. Uh, I'm not trying to get subscribers or, or anything like that. I'm, I'm done. I want to share some ideas and now I'm done. Uh, but because I've spent a bunch of time thinking about Opus Dei and Jose Maria Escriva and trying and probably failing uh, to understand it, um, I'm going to share my final thoughts about uh, how I, th I think one can make sense of Jose Maria Escriva and Opus Dei. And I don't claim this is the truth. I don't claim to have proven it. It's just a way of trying to make sense of things. It's a theory. It's a possibility. Here it goes. Jose Maria Escriva was a vain man with a narcissistic personality disorder. Opus Dei is his personal project made for his personal glory. People with narcissistic personality disorders have big projects like that, whether it's founding a thousand year Reich or making America great again. Jose Maria Escriva's project was founding the work of God that would last until the end of time, and he co opted Catholicism for his personal project. Scholars who look at Opus Dei's early history find that Escriva is unclear about its mission and message. Like, he knows he's got something great and big. It's founded by God. It's big, it's beautiful, it's better than anything else anyone has ever seen. He just doesn't know what it is. Yet, paradoxically, at the same time, the myth is that Opus Dei has always been the same and has never changed. Jose Maria Escriva wanted Opus Dei to be completely and utterly unique and special. So he denied that it or he had any influences. No, it was founded directly by God. <laughs> there was another priest doing work with university students around the same time Jose Maria Escriva was. Uh, that guy's name was Father Poveda. Uh, a telling anecdote, <laughs> one time a young Mexican member of Opus Dei uh, innocently asked Jose Maria Escriva about Father Poveda uh, in a get-together, and Jose Maria Escriva completely lost it and went on an angry tirade that just absolutely surprised everyone in the room. Uh, it's interesting that he was extremely touchy when someone even indirectly hinted that Opus Dei could have had any influences uh, or some ideas could have been derived from somewhere else. Saintly founders have a certain amount of detachment from their foundations, not Jose Maria Escriva. It was clearly his precious. Jose Maria Escriva is a complicated and convoluted character. He's ex he is extremely difficult to understand. I don't understand him. He seems to have been truth challenged uh, from the beginning about his biography, the work's history, everything. The whole image he crafted of his sanctity is a myth, a lie. It isn't true in the slightest. He dedicated tremendous amounts of resources to building up the cult of personality and myth of his sanctity during his lifetime. If I wrote a book about Jose Maria Escriva or Opus Dei, I would, I would call it a beautiful lie. And I think he lied to himself about his own motives and intentions. I think he was completely unknown to himself. He exhibited zero self-awareness. He thought he could fake, fake sanctity by saying beautiful things and painting pretty and false images. There is a certain superficiality about him, a focus on image making. But he lacked charity, real love for God, real love for concrete human beings. How did he treat people? Like crap. He treated people like crap. Uh, it's not a nice thing to say. It's also not a nice thing to do. The people that lived with him and worked with him feared him and his angry tirades. The theory of psychological projection suggests that people can project onto others the qualities they have within themselves that they reject. And Jose Maria Escrivá was constantly finding pride in everyone else, anyone who criticized him or his work. Pride, arrogance. Uh, in fact, I'm going to suggest that as a litmus test for how much of Jose Maria Escrivá's spirit you have. 
uh, the more you are unable to consider the possible merit of anything I suggest in these videos, the more you can only see my pride and my arrogance, the more of Jose Maria Escrivá's spirit you have. But yeah, Jose Maria Escrivá could write beautiful stuff. He could put on a good show when necessary. Uh, there's a whole performance artistry to his sanctity. Like he's trying to say the sorts of things a saint would say. Like he's trying to do the sort of things a saint would do and then telling others about it. Uh, as if saying and writing saintly things could make up for lack of charity for individual people. An example, and I think this illustrates so much of the weirdness of Jose Maria Escriva in Opus Dei, uh, he frequently said that he wanted to get a, a gigantic precious stone and put it in the base of a chalice so that only our Lord would be able to see it. And he told everyone about that idea. It's a great idea. Uh, so this, this hidden precious stone that only Jesus could see. Uh, but now that chalice is on display in Rome, in Opus Dei's headquarters, with special lighting and special mirrors so that everyone can walk by and see the special stone that Jose Maria Escrivá only wanted our Lord to see. It's just, like, so weird. His lack of charity for concrete human beings and his willingness to use them as instruments for his purposes is perhaps best illustrated by the numerary assistants, who are essentially slave labor in Opus Dei's centers. Too often, older numeraries are left with nothing when they aren't useful anymore. They're victims of the throwaway culture Pope Francis laments. You can read in Opus Libros about how older numeraries are treated in Spain these days. It isn't pretty. But this instrumentalization of persons is true at every level of the organization. Besides Jose Maria Escriva, I've only ever heard of one person who actively discussed his own canonization during his lifetime, who actively gathered objects that would eventually become relics uh, during his lifetime, and that's Saint Marcial Maciel. Oddly and paradoxically, Opus Dei members do a lot of good in the world, and Opus Dei has produced real holiness. It is a mystery. I do not pretend to understand it. I guess it's just what happens uh, with God's grace when people are trying to live gospel ideals, uh, even if they've been deceived and are living in an organization that is essentially a lie. Opus Dei's specialty is painting beautiful images of itself and its history. And its history and message is always changing to match the current situation. Opus Dei is this curious thing that is always changing, yet claims it is always the same and never changes. Uh, its history is, it's like Stalinistic. Uh, it's constantly rewriting its history to match its current story. So many key figures and moments of Opus Dei simply get airbrushed out of its history. For example, most people in Opus Dei don't know that Jose Maria Escriva hated the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the people who lived with him during the council weren't even able to talk about it. They weren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, he thought of John, spoke of John the 23rd as sort of this country hick. Uh, essentially, and he, of Paul VI, he said it was like Satan himself is in charge of the church. Jose Maria Escriva never adopted the new form of the Mass, although I do understand that he had the correct uh, dispensation to continue saying the old form. Now, of course, the Opus Dei public relations message is that Opus Dei was a precursor of Vatican II and that no one was talking about the universal cult to holiness until Jose Maria Escriva was. Uh, the problem is that's simply not the truth. Like, look at Francis de Sales uh, as one example. There were others. I, a few months ago, I read a book on Carmelite spirituality uh, by an early 20th century Italian who said he was writing the book because he wanted to respond to the Pope's call uh, to help people live the universal call to holiness. A more recent example of its chameleon-like nature, uh, Opus Dei just put together an academic conference in Rome on spiritual accompaniment for people in religious movements. I mean, Opus Dei spiritual direction is like the antithesis of spiritual accompaniment, and it's, it's never a term that Opus Dei uses. It's just, it's pure Vatican-facing public relations. Celibate members of Opus Dei are its greatest victims. Opus Dei preys upon the generosity and naivete of young people seeking to do God's will. The numerary lifestyle gives them a life lacking in human joy and connection until they crack or leave. But before then, the work gets some use out of them. The spiritual formation Opus Dei gives its numerary members is not principally oriented toward helping them grow in charity or in love for Jesus Christ. 
Growth and charity is a noticeably absent topic of discussion. Rather, the spiritual formation Opus Dei gives is designed to make them good instruments in the hands of the Opus Dei directors, doing the director's will. It is an instrument of control. Spiritual direction and Opus Dei violates consciences and empties souls. Members of Opus Dei are mostly innocent victims. I believe members of Opus Dei have been misled and lied to about Jose Maria Escrivá. Some of the practices and attitudes he taught are simply not Christian. Most important among these is the practice of putting the good of the institution above the good of human persons, which is to flip Christianity on its head. But members of the work can adopt these attitudes and practices because he was the father. He's a saint. These things are willed by God himself. St. Josemaria Escrivá said so. But these practices and attitudes over time can corrupt consciences. Members of Opus Dei aren't bad people. They're genuinely seeking God and trying to do good in the world. For the most part, they're simply innocent victims of the myth of Jose Maria Escrivá's holiness and Opus Dei's divine origin. But some do become corrupted as they catch more of Jose Maria Escrivá's spirit. There are a few members of the work I know of whom I could say, you truly have your father's spirit. Not a lot, but a few. Opus Dei is extremely hard to understand and pin down. I don't understand it. I don't pretend to. I think that's because it's made up of 99% true and good Catholicism. Good doctrine plus the best of the church's devotional patrimony, mental prayer, the sacraments, the rosary, etc. But it is also 1% pure poison. But that poison ruins everything and changes the institution's essential nature. It is a destructive cult within the Catholic Church and meets all the criteria scholars use to determine if an organization is a cult. Jose Maria Escrivá's sanctity and Opus Dei's divine origin are lies, a collection of myths, an illusion and a delusion. But Jose Maria Escrivá could not have pulled it off by himself. He needed to have collaborators. His foremost collaborators are Don Alvaro and Javier Echeverria. Sure, he might have deceived them to some extent, but at a certain point, they had to deny what their eyes and ears were telling them. The investigation into Jose Maria Escrivá's sanctity was severely compromised. Key witnesses were excluded. Their important testimony was never heard or considered, in part because of the probable perjury of these two men. Of course, it has taken many people to preserve this myth. How deep does the rot go? Part of Opus Dei's myth-making activity is the creation of explanations. There is always an explanation, a beautiful, edifying explanation that attempts to explain the unexplainable, make what is clearly not holy or edifying, holy and edifying. Small example, <laughs> One thing Opus Dei members aren't aware of is Jose Maria Escrivá's absolute obsession with titles and honors. Uh, and early in the 1970s, he decided that he wanted to get a title of nobility. Uh, this is something you were able to purchase. It costs a lot of money. Uh, I'm not sure how much it did cost. I think it was a lot. And when he started doing this, members of the work apparently thought like, what? You've got to be kidding me. Uh, and he caught a lot of grief for it, especially in the Spanish press. He eventually ceded the title to his brother, Santiago. And it was explained that this was always the plan, uh, but that doesn't really add up because Santiago simultaneously and separately uh, was getting his own noble title. I don't know if the work paid for it or not. My guess it did. But it was explained to me uh, personally by a biographer of Jose Maria Escrivá that this utterly bizarre and unexplainable act was actually a sign of virtue uh, and showed Jose Maria's great humility and love. Uh, yeah, because he was willing to do this for his brother and his family's honor, even though he knew he would be criticized for it. <laughs> really? Uh, it's just a small example of the mental contortions that apologists need to do, uh, that they've always done and that they still do. On October 6, 2002, when John Paul II declared him to be a saint in front of hundreds of thousands of people, Jose Maria Escrivá received his reward, the true end 
of all his striving. He succeeded in fooling men, at least for a time. But the truth will eventually come out. How will it come out? When will it come out? I don't know. Maybe the truth will be exposed. Maybe the work just dies a slow death. Maybe it just shrivels up and fades away, showing its true origins. So that's my uh, take on Jose Maria Escriva and Opus Dei. It's just a theory, just a possibility. It's admittedly pretty unbalanced, but I feel I was lied to for so many years about what Jose Maria Escriva was really like. Uh, so it's a challenge for me to see his virtues right now. Um, I could be totally mistaken. Part of me hopes that I am. Uh, but I know this for certain. Time will tell. Time will definitely tell. Thanks for watching. And goodbye.